Welcome to the Jongets Games Impressions Vlog. Today, I'll be discussing four games that I was able to play for the first time recently, and I do want to mention that if you'd prefer to listen to this vlog instead of watch it, then you can do so by searching for the Jongets Games Podcast wherever you normally listen to podcasts. I'd also like to ask that if you end up enjoying this video, that you please click the like button for it down below, as well as the subscribe button for the channel. In addition to that, if you'd like to directly support the channel in the creation of future videos just like this one, then please go to jongetsgames.com support. There you'll find a bunch of ways that you can really help things out, and some of them have pretty cool bonuses like voting on a few of the videos that I film each month. All right, let's now start talking about games, and the first of these is Cafe. Now, this is a recent publication from Pythagoras Games, and I saw some images of this one on Twitter, and I think I saw a video for it too, and I thought it looked pretty cool. I reached out to the publisher, and I was able to get a discounted press copy, and I have now actually played the game a couple of times. We played it uh, twice, two players in a row in an evening. Uh, now, thematically, this game is all about growing coffee beans and then processing them all the way until you have a cup of coffee. And I'll tell you that um, my wife and I, we both really, really just like coffee. So thematically, we're not really aligned with what you're doing here, but that's fine. The art style is great, and we still really enjoyed um, the theming of the game, even though we don't like coffee. Now, mechanically, in this game, you're going to go through a series of rounds. And in each round, you're going to be taking a single card from the center of the table, and you're going to add it into your tableau of cards. And when you place it down, you have to cover up um, certain segments of the other cards that you have placed. Now, I'm not going to go into all the details of the card placement rules, but you have to cover up uh, at least something. And you are not allowed to tuck a new card underneath. You have to put it on top. Now, after you've placed your card, you can then take actions, and you get a number of actions equal to the number of coffee cup icons that are showing up in your overall tableau. Now, each action lets you do uh, some part of the overall coffee process. Uh, it's essentially a four-step process. You can activate a single field of coffee beans, which is going to be a bunch of coffee bean icons that are orthogonally adjacent to each other. So that means if you place your cards so that lots of beans are next to each other, you can be efficient, spend one action, and put a uh, bean down onto each one of of those uh, spots that don't already have a bean. The next step is you can activate your uh, drying icons and you can once again activate an orthogonal um, chunk of them. So if there's just one drying icon by itself, then one action will activate that. But if you have three of them all kind of next to each other, then one action will activate all three of them. So you're going to try to put those drying icons next to each other and each drying icon will take all beans of a specific color from uh, the fields and put it down onto that drying spot. So you're trying to get lots of the same color bean. Obviously, you're trying to dry them, and then you're trying to put the roasters down, uh, which are an icon as well, and you activate a uh, cluster of roasters just like the drying fields, and each roaster can take all of the beans of a specific color, and you put that onto that roaster. And finally, the fourth step of the process, you can spend an action to remove all of the beans from your roasters and put them down either into your own warehouse or onto coffee shops, which are also part of your overall tableau. Those coffee shops tell you which type of coffee they need, and when you put the coffee onto those spots, then they will give you a certain number of endgame victory points as long as you have not covered up any part of that uh, coffee shop by the time the game ends. Now, the coffee that you have in your warehouse is going to be potentially worth victory points to you. Um, you are incentivized to try and be even with those. You don't want to have a lot of one thing and a little of another, and I'm not going to go into the victory point details of it, but um, you definitely want a wide variety of coffee color beans in this game. So you're going to play through a series of rounds, and then the person with the most victory points from their um, uh, coffee shops that are filled up, as well as from their warehouse, is going to be the winner. And you know, the main interaction point in this game is uh, taking the cards from the middle of the table. Now, uh, when you are taking these, you're always going to have three available, and then you draw a new one, and then the next person can take from those, and then you draw a new one, so everyone always has three cards that they can choose from. And uh, I've only played this game at two players, but as far as I can tell, it's not going to be hugely different from uh, one player count to the next, because uh, realistically, you only interact with somebody else at that card draw spot in the middle of the table. Uh, after that, you're kind of just working on your own little puzzle in front of you, trying to be as efficient with your actions as you can. And obviously, you have this impossible puzzle where you want the beans to be next to each other, the drying uh, spots to be next to each other, and the roasting spots to be next to each other. You also are trying not to cover up your cafes, and you are trying to get new coffee icons because every coffee icon in your tableau is going to be an action. Uh, now, when you take a card that has a coffee icon on it, you do have to spend a coffee from your warehouse, which means you are potentially 
essentially spending victory points, which is something to keep in mind, but you can't do all of these things. <laughs> so you have to be as balanced as you can. Um, now we ended up playing back-to-back -back games of this. We played it once and we really enjoyed it. So we set it up and we played it again right afterwards. Uh, each play took probably less than 30 minutes, between 20 and 30 minutes, something like that. Um, and uh, it has a lot of uh, really thinky, crunchy, puzzly decisions to be made. Um, when you take a tile, you have to cover up at least something. So that means it's kind of like a Tableau engine building game where you have to break your engine every single turn, and you're hoping that the net result of you breaking your engine is actually going to make your engine a little bit better in the long run. So you have real decisions to make, like do you cover up this cafe and then not even bother sending uh, beans to it because that's going to, or I guess roasted coffee to it, because that'll make you stronger for getting other points for the end of the game, uh, or do you not do that because you're not sure if you're going to get another one of these cafes because those are a really important thing to keep in mind. And uh, I found myself, uh, I can't remember how the scores worked out. I think I won one game and I think Jessica won the other one. And uh, I remember in the second game, I was really imbalanced. I had, I think, far too many roasters and I got them all next to each other, but I didn't have enough of the drying fields to fully utilize all of those roasters. So you are also trying to keep in mind that you don't want to over-specialize. You want to kind of do everything well, but not go crazy on one thing. Um, I also remember in that game, I did not make a certain type of coffee very well. Well, I was great at gray, green and I was great at red, but I think yellow had almost none out or something like that. And that really impacted my ability to get lots of points from the warehouse because I had lots of excess coffee and I was not being even with those. Now, that does mean that I could spend the coffee that I felt like would be an excess to take more cards that would give me more actions. So I'm pretty sure in the second play, I got up to the maximum of, I believe it's eight actions. Uh, so that was certainly good, but um, it's just a lot of things that you have to consider in a really small box. Uh, overall, I'm, I'm quite impressed. I actually scanned this one in and built a tabletop simulator mod. I'm hoping to play this one with other players at some point soon because I think it's a really cool system. It's a lot to think about in a relatively uh, short playing game. And I have been impressed. Uh, Jessica quite liked it as well. So uh, I'm looking forward to more plays of this one. Again, I don't think it's gonna be drastically different at different player counts. I've only seen the two player game right now. And um, maybe it would be slightly longer, um, because at a higher player count, because people are, you know, thinking about what card to put down. Um, but, uh, what we actually did is, um, there's always going to be three cards available. So uh, when one person was deciding on these three cards, the next person drew the top card and just started considering it because by definition, the person before them is going to take a card and that will go out there. So that kind of sped things up. And I think in a, uh, um, a larger player count game, uh, you could also do that to try and speed things up. If that card's really great for you, then that makes the decision relatively easy. So yeah, that's Cafe. I, I am impressed. I'm hoping to play this one more. It's a relatively small box with a, gr a great art aesthetic and uh, some pretty streamlined rules and uh, I think it's going to be sticking around. Next up, we have game number two, which is Floor Plan. Now, I think this one came out this year. It's a relatively recent release, and it is a roll and write style game that can play up to uh, infinite people. It's one of those games where um, you know, dice are rolled, and then everyone will make a decision on their own based off of those dice that has no impact on anybody else. Uh, so uh, we actually played a 10-player game of this on Tabletop Simulator, which was a bit crazy. My computer had trouble uh, dealing with that amount of stuff going on, but we made it work. Uh, we had a bit of a, a mini board Board Game Geek Con day a couple of weeks ago because obviously Board Game Geek Con did not happen. And we played games from 8 a.m. until I think about 11 p.m. or so. We played just a bunch of games. And in the middle, we played Floor Plan. Now, this is a game all about being an architect drawing up the plans for a house, essentially. And the way it works is you are going to have these dice be rolled and then on every turn, you are going to either uh, add a uh, room to your overall floor plan, or you're going to add features. Now, the dice are important here because the dice numbers are going to tell you how big your room is if you go for a room. Let's say a two and a four are rolled. That means you have to put a two by four size room down. And then you label that room uh, with either uh, one of the two options based off of those dice. A two is associated with one type of room. I can't remember specifically. Maybe it's a closet. And then a four is associated with another type of room. Can't remember specifically, but maybe it's a bedroom. And that means you can choose one of those two 
and label that room as a closet or bedroom. So you are um, uh, constrained by the size from the dice, but also what type of room it is. And the other thing that you can do is instead you can put down furnishings and that could be like couches, but it could also be a deck. It could be uh, stones in the backyard that if you make a full circle of, you will put water down to make a pool. You could also plant a tree. Uh, and uh, very importantly, you can add doors and windows to your house. Now, in the middle of the table, there are a series of um, uh, goal cards. I can't remember specifically what they're called. I think they're uh, different people who have different desires for your overall plan. And each person has a couple of different conditions on them. So what you're trying to do is design your house so that it matches up with the goals in the middle of the table. And every time you meet one of those goals in the middle of the table, you score it. You write those points down on your uh, pad, and then you get a, a one-shot bonus that you can use to help yourself out in the future. And you keep playing the game until uh, at least one player has completely filled out all of their goals or until one player has no legal plays to make. But in our 10 player game, it, it went until uh, one person filled their goals. In fact, two people filled their goals out at the same time. So um, there are obviously more details and uh, minutiae that I could go into, but that's the kind of vibe of the game. So the dice are rolled and you're trying to do good things based off of that, trying to build a house that looks right and also put good stuff in it. And those goals can be really varied. Uh, we had a goal to have fountains, which essentially were uh, uh, pools that were next to each other. Uh, we also had a goal to have a certain number of windows facing out from a living room. And there were a few other ones. And ultimately, this game lends itself towards making some really ridiculous houses. Um, when the game ended, I had a house that had no doors to the outside. I had a couple of trees and some nice decks and I made a fountain and all that. I had a whole bunch of rooms inside, but you couldn't leave. Also, you couldn't get in. There's a bunch of windows, so I guess you had to enter this house through the window. And I will say, somewhat embarrassingly, that I came uh, dead last out of 10 people. It wasn't even close. I was like many points behind the next person. So definitely don't build the house that I made, but I still really enjoyed it. Uh, it was fun to play with that many people and it was fun to see uh, what everybody did. Uh, having a data set that large was kind of interesting because it seemed like there were uh, a couple of people who were, uh, there's somebody who won obviously, and there was one or two people who were close to that score. And then there were like four or five people all within a couple of points from each other, kind of in the middle. And then there were a couple of stragglers and then there was me <laughs> all the way down at the bottom. And um, I will say that, you know, it's a dice game. Um, if a specific goal, I remember if a two and a one had been rolled in that last round, I would have made like 11 victory points and would have shot up to like second place or something like that. But obviously that did not happen and it did not work out very well for me with my strange house that you couldn't leave. A couple of people had houses that looked like you would potentially live in them. Uh, some other houses were strange. I remember there's one house with a long a uh, closet hallway that was full of couches that split the house up. So you had to like walk across couches in order to get from one side to the other. And I remember in my house, I had a bathroom that was almost as large as the living room next to a bedroom that was the size of like your standard closet. So there's just some ridiculous stuff that happens, but it was fun. I, I enjoyed the challenge. It was a lot thinkier than I expected. There's uh, obviously all of these goals to consider and, um, you know, with two main things you can do with your dice, a lot of things to consider as you're building this out and you will definitely find yourself regretting some of your previous decisions. You have to plan things out to make sure that you are open to as many of these goals as you can. Uh, you can score goals multiple times and that's certainly something that uh, uh, many of us did in order to get to the end of the game. Uh, now, ultimately, uh, I think everyone enjoyed it. I don't think everyone uh, loved it overall, but Jessica and I really enjoyed it. I actually bought a copy, so it arrived. Uh, we have it here because I think it'd be fun, um, even at just two players. It was a really cool experience overall, uh, and I'm looking forward to playing it more. Okay, let's move on to game number three, which is The Red Cathedral. Now, I actually made a sponsored tutorial for this game, so I'll start right off and say that I am, I am biased. I was paid to make content for the game, uh, but I subsequently decided I was quite interested in playing the game because I liked what I saw in the tutorial, and there is a official tabletop simulator mod for it, so we got to play a three-player game of this uh, during that board and game geek con mini convention day thing that we had. Now, uh, this is a, a pretty neat little game where you are doing uh, resource management, trying to get various resources, uh, trying to build up 
uh, collectively a cathedral, the Red Cathedral. And now, mechanically, the way it works is on your turn, you choose one of three different options. The first option is that you can reserve a spot on the cathedral that you would like to build later out. Um, that's going to give you a bonus token, which you can put down onto a workshop tile, workshop spot in front of you. And that's important because another option that you can do on your turn is you can gather resources. Now, in the middle of the table, there's a board and it has dice that kind of go around the outside of it and um, eight different areas. And when you gather resources, you're going to select one of those dice and move it clockwise around the board an exact number of times equal to the pips on that die. And then you will get resources based off of where that die lands equal to the number of dice that are in that overall area. So you have a decent number of options and you're trying to essentially put these dice into spots where other dice are to get lots of resources, which is good. But then also, if you have a workshop tile on a spot that matches the die color that you just moved, you get the bonus of that tile, which again, you got from reserving a spot out on the Red Cathedral. So there's a nice little synergy going on there. Now, the third thing that you could do on your turn, as your entire turn, is deliver up to uh, three things to the cathedral itself, which means you are putting your resources down onto spots that you have reserved, or you can spend resources to add decorations and ornamentations to parts of the cathedral that are already done. Now, once a spot that you have reserved has all the resources it needs, you flip it over, you get the associated resources, and if you did this uh, quicker than other people below you on the cathedral, they actually take uh, penalties, which is kind of interesting, and it definitely came into play in our uh, one play of it. Now, when you get points, there's actually two types of points in this game. There is the uh, prestige, and then there is, I believe, recognition or something like that. Uh, now, every certain amount of recognition is going to give you one prestige, and as you get farther along the track, that amount is going to change. So that means early in the game, if you get a bunch of uh, recognition, that might give you, like, one or two prestige. But late in the game, if you get a bunch of uh, recognition, that might give you, like, four or five prestige. And what this means is... As you're playing through the game, there are many different things that you can do, but it all kind of comes to a head once the game comes to an end. Uh, the game uh, ends as soon as any one player has completed uh, six of their reserve spots out there on the cathedral. And in our one play of it, I ended the game, and I have to admit that I thought I had it in the bag. I didn't crunch all the numbers, but it seemed like I was in a really good spot to win the game. Um, uh, Jessica was playing it as well. She had five of the six done, and another friend, Anastasia, had uh, just four out of the six done. So I felt like I was in a good position, but... The thing is, whenever you complete those cards in the cathedral, they give you recognition. And I pushed that really hard, which meant a lot of the recognition I got, especially early on in the game, did not give me that many prestige points. Instead, what my opponents did is they finished less pieces of the cathedral, but what they did is they added ornamentation, specifically ornamentation down, which is like doors and a cross on the top, with jewels. Now, if you spend jewels alongside the ornamentation, you get prestige, which is not recognition, which means you jump to the next prestige spot on the board. So while I was just going crazy on recognition all game long and I never put a single gem into the cathedral, my opponents built less of the cathedral, but they put ornamentation down that was really shiny with these gems, and they essentially were able to stay even with me until we got near the end of the game. And once we calculated everything up, I actually uh, lost. I think I came in third place. It was close. It was it, the, the, the spread between all of us was like, four or so points, uh, but Jessica was able to win this one, I'm pretty sure. Uh, now, in the cathedral, once the game is over, you actually score each of the towers of the cathedral. Um, the number of completed spots on it is going to dictate how much uh, prestige that is worth, and, and the ornamentation adds to that, and then you see who did the best, who added the most ornamentation, and also who just built the most spots in that um, that tower, and then you divide the points um, uh, to the players. I'm not trying not to go into the specifics of it, but it's very important to try and have a majority of stuff in these various towers, and in particular, you want to have a majority of your stuff in the biggest towers because those pay out the best, and I think the reason that I lost is because I made... Uh, an assumption that there was a big scoring tower that I would be able to score. I didn't think there was any way my opponents could catch up to me, and they did. Uh, in fact, they didn't just catch up and tie, they actually caught up and took the lead away from me, and that was the difference of the game. So I think if I'd played differently, I would have focused more of my ornamentation on that big tower to lock it in, but then I would have gotten less points for the other spots, so it's definitely something to keep in mind. Uh, now, when the dust settled on this game, and I'm, I, there's some significant things I haven't talked about, but you get the general idea. Um, we all enjoyed it. It was a it was a neat experience. I think it took probably approaching two hours, maybe like a little over 90 minutes, something like that. Uh, and it was a first play for all of us. Um, and I think that we all enjoyed the play, but I don't think it 
really blew any of us away. Um, it's definitely a game I would not mind playing again in the future because I like resource management. And I like the uh, kind of engine building this that you're going on. And I liked the competition that you had uh, in the middle of the table with the different towers. But again, nothing really screamed to me like, this is new, this is fresh, this is uh, something I've never seen before. It's a bunch of things that I have seen before. I guess the most innovative uh, part of the game is that dice uh, market uh, mechanic, which is pretty cool. I guess I'm underselling the game. Uh, that did feel somewhat fresh. The the idea that you could um, move these dice around, it's a bit puzzly to get try to get the resources that you need, and also specific dice, uh, namely the white die and a die that matches your player color, you can actually spend money to move that die farther so you have a little bit more control. So working those out to get um, nice little combo engines and then activate guilds in the corners of the board, uh, that was pretty cool. So yeah, I'm underselling it. That was a pretty neat part of the game. Uh, but yeah, overall, we walked away from it um, having enjoyed the experience. Uh, I, I'm looking forward to playing this one more. I don't think it's at the top of my must-play-again-soon list. I, I do hope that I get it played again soon at some point. Um, but uh, yeah, it just came together really well. I think it's an impressive uh, production. Um, the components are great. The art is great overall. And I think that um, there's a lot of good stuff going on in this game. It's not the most exciting game that I've played recently, but it was fun, and um, I think that's really all that's important, really. All right, we've reached the fourth and final game I'll be discussing today, and that one is Walnut Grove. Now, this is not a new game. I think it was published in about 2011, and it's the same designer as Eclipse, which is a very well-known, uh, large, expansive, like, you know, five to six hour uh, 4X space drama battle game. But Walnut Grove looked like this cute little Euro game that only has a four-page rulebook, and I kind of heard about it over the years, like kind of popped up into my consciousness and then uh, kind of went away. I never really knew anything about it. But then uh, one of the people in our gaming group owns a copy and they've been really wanting to play and we found a tabletop simulator mod for it. So we ended up playing this one as our first game of that mini Board Game Geek convention day. Um, we played a four-player game of it and it seemed like it made sense. It was uh, just a four-page rulebook, so it should be a quick teach overall and it should be a pretty quick game overall. At least that's what we thought. And what we didn't realize is it's actually a very thinky game for only having a four-page rulebook. Now, the way this game works is you're not actually making a grove of walnuts. Apparently, it's based off of a town called Walnut Grove, which was kind of a, uh, a western town in the United States. Um, I think not quite Wild West, but, you know, kind of uh, that kind of uh, theme. Now, mechanically, what you're doing is you're going to go through a series of phases in each one of the game's rounds, and it's going to start by you drawing um, some tiles, the number that you draw is different round around, and the number that you get to keep is different round around. And you're going to place that down into a tile laying area in front of you where you have different types of areas. There might be a lake, and there might be a, a rock quarry, or maybe a field where you can have your sheep uh, grazing. Uh, now, the placement restrictions here are really loose, if I remember. I think you can put them really anywhere oriented in any different direction, but you want to make large fields of the same type. And there are also fences that show up on some of these tiles. And if you make complete fenced in areas, then that will be worth extra points at the end of the game. So you want to keep that in mind. Now, after you've chosen your tile and you put it down, there is a worker placement movement type of phase where in the middle of the table, there's a board and every player has a single worker. Now, based off of a certain order that I'm not going to go into, each player is going to take a single action and you can go as far around the board as you want to. You have to go clockwise. But when you cross a certain spot on either side, you actually have to pay a coin penalty and coins can potentially be worth victory points to you at the end of the game. So you're going to go to an action spot and then do whatever that says. And that might let you recruit new farm hands that will join in uh, for you in the next round. Uh, you also might be able to get improvements, which will give you ways to score bonus victory points at the end of the game based off of different conditions. Uh, you can also go to a spot to just get some resources, and another location lets you uh, trade in your resources for coins. Now, I mentioned that coins are potentially worth points, and that's the first strange part of this game. Now, the coins are uh, face down. You can take them from a face down stack, and they have a zero, a one, or a two on the back of them, and you take them randomly. So that means I might sell three things, and I take three coins and I look at them and I might have two zeros and a two. Uh, now the number on the back is the number of victory points that coin is worth at the end of the game. So that might seem awful. Like that sucks. I got a couple of zeros. Like you obviously want lots of numbers, but the thing is you put those coins into your warehouse where you have to store them and you can upgrade and get more warehouses as well. And remember what I said, when you go around certain spots on the board, you have to give up a coin. Well, you can give up a zero cost coin when you cross those spots. So to a certain extent, if you got all of the, uh, all twos, 
you might be a little bit bummed because that means crossing over the threshold means you're actually giving up victory points. So there is definitely a way to deal with the um, coin draw luck. Now, after you've done the worker placement, you then send all of your farmers out into your fields and every farmer will activate an entire contiguous field of a color and they'll make one resource for you for each tile in that field. And then there are storage spots that you can put down on the field or if there aren't enough spots, you can put those down into your warehouse if you have room. Now, at the end of the round, you actually have to feed your people. And this is where the game gets really uh, tight. Now, every single one of uh, the people that you have in front of you uh, is going to need uh, certain amounts of food, if I remember correctly, and almost all of your people are going to need wood to light a campfire so that they don't get super cold <laughs> during the night. Now, one of the things that you can do is actually build out little houses for your people so that they don't have to spend wood every single round. But I'll tell you right now, in this one play of it, I was never able to get any of those and actually got a pretty big uh, crew of people. So I had a huge... Um, uh, debt of wood, essentially. Every single turn, I needed to get um, at least, I think, four wood just to have enough heat going towards my farmers so that I didn't take these uh, negative penalty cards, which could be pretty significant. You definitely don't want to take those penalties. But then also, each one of the farmers that you have needs to be fed, and if you don't feed them, you take more penalties. So what this means is you have this system where you are uh, expanding your fields and you're getting various things and you're spending your resources in order to get those things, but those resources are potentially food that you could feed your people. Um, for the most part, I guess you don't feed them uh, stone or uh, uh, wood, although they burn the wood. Uh, but what it means is you do a whole bunch of things, and at the end of each round, you were hoping to just eke out a little bit of an advantage. It definitely felt like um, times were tough in a Wild West type town. Like you're being a farmer and you're making all this stuff and then you're getting rid of it. And then you hope to be just a little bit better <laughs> than you were at the start. Uh, it's definitely not the kind of game where you do, uh, you end with a large profit. You're just eking out tiny little profits as you're trying to build everything out. Obviously getting more uh, people means you can make more stuff, but that's another uh, person that's going to be cold at night. So you have to give them wood and it's another person that might have to eat. And each round you flip over a random tile and that dictates not only the number of field tiles that you take and put out, but it also dictates uh, an extra production type. So a certain type of field uh, produces better and another type of thing will sell better. So that's all good things, but it will also tell you how much extra wood you have to spend just as a flat fee, because I guess it was colder in general and certain farmers are going to be hungrier than normal. And this is even more impactful. So in our play, I had a couple of the blue farmers and they eat fish because blue water anyway. And there were two rounds in a row where the blue farmers needed to eat two fish each. And I had two of these farmers and it was really impactful. It was really punishing. And I was just trying to eke out tiny little advantages. Uh, and uh, at the end of the day, I think the game took over 90 minutes. Like it was definitely a longer play experience than we were expecting and a much crunchier, thinkier play experience than we were expecting. And I think all of us enjoyed it. Um, I quite enjoyed it. And the person, uh, a friend, Anastasia, who owns it, um, she quite enjoyed it as well. In fact, the mod was a bit, bit lacking. So uh, she's uh, made a, a new mod that we can play for ourselves. And we haven't played it again, but we are definitely planning on it. Uh, now, the biggest, I guess, uh, a potential issue with the game, I guess, is the coin draw variance. Uh, in this play, I did not win, but I had a solid shot to win. On my last turn, I did a massive trade and I got a whole bunch of coins. And in fact, I had invested in a bunch of warehouses so I could store a whole bunch of resources and a whole bunch of coins. I had a lot of coins at the end of the game. And in that last turn, because of decisions that I made and risks that I took, I ended up losing one point overall instead of gaining points. I, I took, I believe it was three coins and there were um, a couple of zeros and a one. And then because I took a risk, I did not actually have enough stuff to have enough wood, which meant I took a penalty token, which dropped me down. I think it lost me two points, which means I, I, lost, I lost one point in the last round. Whereas if I had drawn a bunch of twos, then I would have made a significant number of points. And then I think I likely would have won. I think I was close enough. So it is possible that you could win or lose this game based off of how you draw those coins, but also you know, in uh, the game's defense, that was the strategy I decided to push for near the end of the game. I decided to say, okay, I'm going to go hard on getting these coins where, uh, versus trying to get improvements, which just give you static a number of points. And there's lots of other ways that you can get points. So in the long run, I'm not sure if after multiple plays that coin draw variance is going to bug me or if it will uh, kind of balance out with kind of everything else that I'm seeing. But uh, in general, I'm really impressed with this game. Uh, again, it just has four pages of rules, which are quite straightforward to, to learn and to teach. And then it's a tough, punishing, quite thinky game. Uh, the worker placement can be uh, quite punitive, like 
if somebody goes to a spot right before you, that might be the only spot to get you a thing that you really needed. You have to try to do something else. Uh, and there are definitely lots of like ah moments when somebody took a spot that you really wanted to go to. And lots of moments where you're looking down and you're like, I'm just one wood shy or one f uh, fish shy. If only <laughs> the double fish worker payment hadn't happened that one round, um, then maybe I'd be in a better position. So it's a Euro game with um, definitely some luck variance. And uh, some people probably won't like that. But uh, overall, it doesn't bug me too much, even though that luck variance likely lost me the game. And I'm looking forward to exploring this one more. I think it's got some really cool ideas, even though it's uh, certainly not new. It's like a nine-year-old game or so. But uh, this one is relatively high on my list of games that I want to get back to. Well, that's going to wrap up this vlog. Uh, I've now, at this point, talked about all of the new games that I've played, uh, and I have lots more new games that are on my list that I really want to play, some of which I've learned the rules to, but I haven't actually gotten to. So it's likely there's going to be more of these impressions vlogs coming out in the future. Uh, hopefully, I can actually get a lot of these played, even though there are other games that I, I still continue to want to play more. Obviously, I want to play Walnut Grove again. I thought that was really great. I want to play Cafe again. Oh, that's relatively high on my list. And then uh, Anno 1800 keeps getting played over and over again. And uh, you know what? Uh, Lost Ruins of Arnak is a game I really like to come back to. So uh, there's a lot of good games that I've played over the last couple of months and a lot of potentially good games that I haven't gotten to yet uh, and just lots of good times ahead. So uh, yeah, I think that's going to wrap up this vlog. As always, I'd like to thank everyone who's been supporting this channel, including these producer-level Patreon supporters. If you too would like to directly support the channel in the creation of future videos just like this one, then please go to jongetsgames.com support. Also, if you enjoyed this video, then please click the like button for it down below, as well as the subscribe button for the channel. Thanks for watching.